So good morning. Wolf, thank you for inviting me over. I think this is the third, maybe fourth time I'm over here. Um, and every year I see a big increase in the quality of the games. Uh, very happy to be here. I think I get a lot of inspiration from this myself that I can take home uh, and give to my daily job. Uh, my name is Jan Jaap Sebers. I'm uh, one of the founders uh, and co owner of a company in the Netherlands called Gretel Games. We are a serious game development company. Um, today I want to uh, talk to you about games that can change the world, and in my opinion, are going to change the world. Um, I want to talk a little bit about serious games, what they are, uh, what I feel is the future for them, um, and also a little bit more in depth what separates this serious games development uh, process from the process of building entertainment games. So, serious games are an up and coming industry. Uh, they have a huge potential for uh, offering new opportunities for training, uh, learning in several different areas industries, education. Um, they can also be very good business opportunities. This is one of the main reasons why I want to go a little bit more in depth on uh, how the development process works. Because I think um, last Tuesday I had a conversation with the uh, Dutch uh, Minister of uh, Economic Affairs. We talked about the discrepancy between the amount of students that follow game education and that graduate every year and the amount of workplaces that the industry can support. Um, there are a lot more students that want to have a job in the game industry uh, and we, we cannot offer them all uh, a job. So I think it's very important to look at new opportunities, for instance, for entrepreneurship and starting a game development company solely based on entertainment games or casual games is very difficult. If you're just starting out and have no cash, uh, only time on your hands, uh, man's got to eat. It's very difficult to build a, a game from scratch and get that published and get monetized. Uh, serious games, on the other hand, are often um, commissioned, for instance, by healthcare institutions or other companies. Uh, they are a much more safe bet for a startup company than uh, building an entertainment game uh, on your own behalf. But uh, all the process that is used in building serious games is very different. Uh, there are some caveats, uh, and I hope to share some of them with you today. Uh, I will try to do so by giving a lot of examples. These examples are mainly from our own productions. There are a couple of uh, external games that I'm showing as well. Uh, hopefully, uh, you can take something away from this. So, a little bit about Grendel Games. We started in 2003. Makes us uh, about 11 years in the business now. We've grown to a company 14 people in size. Um, that is a multidisciplinary team with uh, uh, some freelancers around. We have uh, the expertise itself, uh, that you will find in a regular entertainment uh, game development company, uh, 2D and 3D art, programming, game design, marketing, uh, some things we don't have in house like audio production, we use uh, a lot of freelancers for that. Um, we focus on building serious games. We started out as a company building entertainment games, but as I, as I just said, we were uh, in a company uh, once before, we found it very difficult to uh, monetize entertainment games that we built uh, uh, with our own funding. And we started getting commissioned to do to build simulators. Simulators are not really serious games, we're going to look at that uh, in, in a minute. But that was a very safe bet money-wise. We could get cash from assignments from other people that paid bills and during Build, uh, during these assignments, we could uh, work on the developing our skills. So, the last couple of years, we have uh, got a very strong focus on serious games in healthcare. Uh, we started out building a uh, laparoscopic surgery game, uh, I think five or six years ago. Uh, before that, we did a uh, lot of rehabilitation games, belt rehabilitation. I'll give some examples of those games. Uh, and once you're in a network like that, you start to see that it's very easy people start to find you. They start to recognize you in, within this industry. You start to build a name for yourself. And then instead of having to scrounge for projects, people are going to approach you uh, with requests to build games for them. So if you play your cards right, serious games can be a very profitable uh, market as well. 
This picture is uh, a picture of our office. It's a decommissioned prison building. I think it was built in the 18th century. Uh, and uh, we have uh, our office in there. So what exactly is this a serious game? What constitutes a serious game? I want to give a small example with a video that we made. So, um, where are you warning come from? There is some surgery footage in here. So, hang on to your breakfast. <coughs> This is all about keyhole surgery, or laparoscopy. As you see, it's quite different from open surgery. If you can eat with a knife, fork, and spoon, you will have all the technical skills to do open surgery. The only other necessity is knowledge. Technical skills for laparoscopy, on the other hand, are much more than that. You need to train technical skills before doing laparoscopy on a patient. There are all sorts of effective simulators for that purpose. The problem is that they are very rarely used. Why is it? Because simulators are predictable and boring. Residents want to be challenged to play sandbox-like games with unpredictability and puzzles, like real surgery. To increase the simulated use, we made a game for the Nintendo Wii U that can be played with laparoscopic instruments. For that purpose, we made dedicated tool shells. The game itself does not at all resemble human anatomy. We know that technical skills can be learned away from the human context. That gave us an enormous design freedom. The game is the motivating factor. Laparoscopic technical skills the ultimate goal. That is, what we call stealth learning. There are two ways in education to persuade pupils, with a stick or with a carrot. What we made is one big carrot. And all that on a game console to make it sturdy and affordable, so it can be played at home, in the office by doctors, students and nurses. It can also be played by children to give them a chance to meet the medical world. Fun, effective and affordable is what we believe. There was a video, an example of Underground, uh, our laparoscopic surgery game. Uh, we are currently in the watch with this game with Nintendo, so hopefully in a couple of weeks we will get uh, the green light and it will be available on the digital television therapy show um, store. I think it's a good example of what we think serious games should be. Uh, but before we go into our vision on that, let's, let's look at the definition. I think this definition from Wikipedia, a serious game or applied game is a game designed for a primary purpose other than pure entertainment. So this constitutes that this game that you are playing that is a serious game should have some kind of effect. It should teach you something, or you should be able to train something with it, or it should uh, give you information in some way or another. Um, so there are many purposes serious games might be used for. Let's, let's look at some examples of, of purposes. Uh, the video we just saw on the ground, the purpose is surgical training. Uh, we've made games for balance rehabilitation, uh, a game for children who have brain damage. Uh, they have lost control over their balance and they need to retrain this balance using physical therapy exercises. Soft skills training is a project uh, we're working on to train interaction between team leaders and their team to uh, more effectively guide these teams with their projects. Uh, we try to use very, uh, very uh, sophisticated facial uh, motion capture uh, to display emotions uh, of people in a virtual world uh, that you would have, then have to interact with to steer these people in the direction that you want. Elderly mobility. This is a project from Kyushu University in Japan. Uh, she's some kind of arcade machine, and in this arcade machine, uh, snake heads pop up, and the elderly have to stomp on these snake heads with their feet uh, as fast as they can. Uh, the patterns that the snake heads appear gets faster and faster uh, as the game progresses, uh, and this exercise trains specific muscles in the upper legs of the, of the player that prevent them from uh, falling. So they have more control over their walking, so they can lift their feet up better which reduces the chance of falling over. This is uh, algebra training. This is creation of Dragon Box. Uh, very cool game that uh, uses a very intuitive and fun approach to teach people uh, algebra, even at a very young age. So with all these purposes, what kind of target audience are we looking at with these, uh, with these series games? So for instance, Underground is meant for surgical professionals. The balance rehabilitation game is aimed at kids. Uh, elderly mobility game is aimed at the elderly. Um, there are also
also some products that are on the market that other people are developing that might not fit these, this, this series game wheel very well. Uh, and I say this because I want to try to make a distinction between what we feel is a series game and what others might portray it as a series game. So if we come back to this definition again, uh, I've highlighted the word game, a series game, or what game is a game designed for this primary purpose other than pure entertainment. So this is an example of something that we built. Uh, this is our first well, super use game project. It's actually a simulator. The simulator teaches engineers on a big tanker ship the location of all the machines and the working of these machines. Um, it's a very accurate representation of the simulator. It uses game technology, but it's not really a game. There are no game mechanics in there. Uh, there's no real challenge for the players. So we, we can't really call this a game. Um, gamification is a term that many of you probably have heard somewhere. Um, gamification, I don't think gamification is really well defined. Uh, my personal opinion of it is that slap, slap a high score on a project, on a product, and you have a gamification project. Um, this is a, an image from a project that we are developing for a local hospital. This is a, a 3D operating theater. Uh, in, in which you have to uh, use the you have to set up the machine uh, in, in preparation for the uh, for the operation. So this is for nurse assistants to get to know where all the instruments in the operating theater are and how they work. Well, this is this is a, an example of a project we're going to get in later. The design process was not very fluent with this project. The client wanted some kind of game solution. But he didn't know exactly what. Then we started designing, designing. They, it, it turned out they very much valued the accuracy of the environment and the realism of the environment, the realism of the working of the instruments, much more than it, it being an actual game. Uh, and we found that those two things are, are pretty difficult to combine properly. E-learning apps. This is a very blurry, I see the screenshot of a game that we, that we made. Uh, this is a, a Twitter visualizer. Uh, same story as with this last, uh, with, with the last example. We had a client who said, I, wa I want something with a series game. I hear these, these series games are very suitable for well, whatever purpose you might have. It will be a game. Then we started trying to figure out what, what is it that you want. Well, I have, I'm trying to uh, visualize social interaction between people on Twitter based on certain subjects. So then we have to think how are you going to gamify that. So we came up with a couple of ideas, uh, and these ideas were shut down because they were too much gaming and not enough visualization of these of the interactions. So there is a mismatch between what the, the client might want and what we think is a serious game. So what is what is our vision? Our vision is the vision of metal games. Serious games should be, they should be fun in the first place. They should look good, they should sound good, and they should be effective. Uh, on the surface, we think serious games should not distinguish from a regular entertainment game. If you build a game for people to play and to have fun with, you can, you can get away with building a simulator or building a e-learning application. So, in our definition, maybe. Serious games are not so different from entertainment games. On the surface, it's why we're starting to point to seriously entertainment, seriously entertaining games. Uh, it's different ways of doing this. So, how will this serious game become so popular lately? Um, entertainment games, they're fun and popular, they can be addictive. A lot of people play entertainment games, they're in the news. Negative connotations to that, people get that they really get the data to series games. Uh, a lot of people play them, and we're, we're looking at this phenomenon, we're thinking, can we somehow use this to our advantage? Uh, is it possible to combine entertainment games with, with teaching or training? And if we are successful in that, you could potentially have a very effective product uh, because of how easily people start to pick up playing games. Uh, we are aiming to subconsciously have people train while they do something that's fun. 
do something that has a low barrier of entry, that they are enthusiastic about, that they're moving forward to, to play again. So repetition and uh, ease of use are, are very important. Institutions and other companies in, in other industries start to recognize this as well. Uh, healthcare in particular, uh, the healthcare industry globally has a number of very big problems. Uh, these problems mainly have to do with uh, monetization. Uh, uh, all over the world, costs of healthcare are rising rapidly. Uh, there are, uh, in, in a couple of years, there's going to be a lot of elderly, uh, many more elderly than the working people can support. So, healthcare industry is now looking at possible solutions to uh, put to, to lower the costs of healthcare and elderly care. This makes them look at serious games and simulators and digital training as potential solutions. However, the development of serious games is not trivial. Uh, there are some new challenges that developers of serious games are faced with, that developers of entertainment games are not necessarily faced with. Uh, a number of these challenges I want to, uh, I want to address. Um, let's look at the first of them. Multi-stakeholder, multiple stakeholder requirements. In entertainment games, there is usually a developer and target audience. So if you want to have a game, if you want to develop a game that suits this, the requirements of the target audience very well, you try to get them involved in the design process. You're going to do uh, A-B testing with them. You're going to have user testing with them. Uh, if you're smart, you try to engage them very early in the process and try to get them, uh, keep them engaged during the whole development trajectory so you can use their feedback on the your development iterations. In series games, the developers also have to interact with these players. So we're still building a game for the target audience that we wish to uh, get involved in the design process. Uh, however, for instance, in healthcare, there are also political experts. In this Bell's meeting rotation game that I, uh, that I, I glanced upon, uh, there are physical therapists that define what exercises need to be performed for uh, a kidney to be effectively rehabilitated. So then we have two different stakeholders in this, in this process. And these clinical experts, they might want something that's different from what the players might want. The clinical experts also have an interaction with the players. So the developers want to talk with the players, and the clinical experts want to talk with the players. The developers want to build a product that suits what the player wants, so they have a lot of fun playing it. The clinical experts play, but they communicate with the players about uh, how they should perform the exercises they, they should do. So a lot of interactions uh, are, are present in this design process. Uh, it's, it's very important to note that these, these clinical experts are often not players themselves. So they are stakeholders, but they are not the end users. And Where's management in all of this? Management of healthcare institutions, they, they have certain needs and wants as well. And parents of, of these kids, maybe they have something to say about, about this as well. And what about intermediaries? So, uh, people that can, that are intermediary between uh, hospitals and clients. Um, what about insurance companies? So, if you're going to do some kind of rehabilitation, yeah, medical insurance is very really important. And are they, for instance, going to refund a bit uh, of the cost of this, of this year's game development? But there are a lot of stakeholders involved in designing and building and using and monetizing series games. That's, that's not something that's very trivial. So, what is best for the product? That's not always very clear. Different stakeholders have different ideas about what's good for a product. Uh, a player thinks it's best for the product to be very fun to play and engaging. And then, Physical therapist might think it's best for the product to be very accurate. And the developer, it's the developer's task to keep all these requirements in check. Um, one stakeholder group might be tempted to fill in the requirements for another stakeholder group. So we are talking with clinical experts a lot with the physical therapists, and they say, oh, we've worked with these kids for years and years, we know exactly what they want and what they like, so you should build your game and design it like this, like so and so and so. And then we start to talk with the kids and we say, how would you like this idea? How would you like this idea? How would you like this idea? And they say, well, nah, that's not really what we think is, is, is fun. So 
these these physical therapists they are filling in the requirements of the children as, as they see it but that might not actually not be accurate um, so all the stakeholders should be involved in the design process and the development process of a series game but they don't always speak the same language we i'm a developer uh, i know how to build games i know how to speak with uh, 3d modelers and with programmers but i do uh, not qualified physical therapist so i don't know the terminology i don't know what's important i don't know how a, a rehabilitation process like clinically is, is performed so that's something that i have to learn Griffin Rider is the, the, the children's balance rehabilitation game that we are developing. We're building it together with a number of rehabilitation institutes. Uh, the game is basically about uh, there's a, a fantasy world in which griffins roam free. Uh, children can ride on the backs of these griffins uh, and by moving their body weight that's tracked by a kinetic camera, they can steer the griffins to different environments. Um, the primary target audience for this game is kids with acquired brain impairments, so they have brain damage by maybe they had an accident, um, and they have lost control over their balance. And there are a number of physical therapy exercises that are prescribed that they have to perform to regain their balance. Uh, the therapists are there to guide their train with them, and one of the requirements of this game was it should be playable with people who do not have this brain impairment, brain damage. Uh, we want to give the kids that play with this game the feeling that they are not different from other kids. Uh, a lot of the solutions that kids in rehabilitation are presented with are they're, they're labeled as, as training and healthy solutions so that makes them feel different. Uh, they just want to go out and play FIFA or uh, Call of Duty like all their friends are doing. So we want to build a game that's also fun to play by other people. So this distinguish there it's not distinguished between whether you're playing a series game or a regular entertainment game. So things that we found are might be very beneficial to uh, try to close this gap, this communication gap. Um, perform lots of visits to both the studio and the institution. So it's very logical, almost when you're a developer, that you go to this rehabilitation institute and look at what the therapists are doing. But it's a lot, a lot, less, a lot less logical that the therapists also come to the development studio and look at how is a game built. It's very difficult to tell someone uh, who's not very known to game development how building a game actually works. Uh, it's, it's better to show them. Uh, it's better to get them uh, involved in the difficulties and how long certain tasks take and what the order of things should be. Uh, it's best to just get them in for a day and show them around everything. Uh, look at what is concept art, look at what is 3D design. What do you have to do to make a 3D model? It has to be modeled, unwrapped, textured, rigged, skinned, animated. A lot of time goes into that. Um, if you show your clinical partners this process, they get a lot more involved and accepting of uh, the activities that the development studio has to do. Um, so explain the development process as well as the clinical process and very important try to create an owner in the clinical team. Often in the development team there's a, a game designer who decides what the game is going to be about and what the game mechanics are going to be. Uh, but this game designer always, always views the project from a game development perspective. It's very important to have someone who is very invested in this project from the clinical side as well. Um, you need someone to supply the development team with all the information that's necessary to make this game valid. Um, we, in this project, in this particular project, we see a lot of physical therapy experts, but none of them have a vision about how this game is going to be played, how it's going to help, what it's going to feel like, and what's going to make the difference with regular therapy exercises. And it's, it's, that sounds really weird, like why would these institutions be doing this uh, series game project uh, altogether if nobody has a vision. But that's, that's just the, the way it is. They look at serious games and they see, well, this is, here, there are potential solutions here. Uh, but then when you start to actually design and build, they don't have a very clear picture of what's possible.
So you have to try to get someone in this team to be really, really invested and in trying to build a vision about the project, about the product, not just from the game development side, but also from the clinical side. Um, there is some research on user centered design uh, that's also published about. Uh, usually, a lot of this research goes uh, in this about uh, a one on one interaction. So, there's not much research yet about user centered design with multiple stakeholders. Uh, that's something that I think would be very interesting to, for instance, to uh, a PhD researcher about trying to to find some set of methodologies that you can use uh, to design a product with more people. So, next topic, what is the GF and Pages business models? In serious games, oftentimes, the player is not the player. So, whoever funds or pays for the product is ultimately not the, the one who's going to play the game. So, I'm going to make a very bold assumptions here. In entertainment and in entertainment game development, if you have this, this really formula, revenue is sales times price plus maybe in app purchases and add income, then uh, you have uh, money. And for the sake of arguments, let's forget about all these things that make my argument a lot more complicated. Marketing, localization, distribution, all that's not so, it's not as simple as this, obviously. Uh, but that's, that's not the point I'm trying to make. How are series games sold? If we are building this balance with the rotation game, uh, how am I going to get it to the final user? So the final user is this kid with brain damage. And this kid with brain damage has to train these exercises within an institution. So I, I can imagine there will be a computer within the institution that he can use to play the game. But who's going to pay for the game? Is that going to be institution? Or is it going to be the healthcare insurance company? Or is it going to be a game that can also be played as a, at home, for instance, which is what we think is a, is a, a very big advantage of using games. Uh, it's very flexible. They're very flexible. You can use machinery, computers, consoles that you already have at home, so why not try to move a little bit of the rehabilitation out of the institution and more into home. But then, a parent will be suddenly responsible for buying this product. So, how are you going? How are you going to advertise this? How are you going to supply the games? Medical institutions, like in the hospitals and, and, and the rehabilitation institutes, they have a very close infrastructure, especially in hospitals where the sensitivity of, of data is very important. Uh, that has to be protected at all costs. It's not very easy for, for instance, a nurse to install a new application on, a, on an iPad actually with that. Um, so who's paying? And what's the, what's the price point for something like this? Should we price this as regular entertainment games? Uh, should we price this as indie games? Or should we price this as a medical, medical solution? Uh, there is uh, a world of difference between how much medical supplies cost and how much uh, regular well, consumer, consumer grade products cost. So how are we going to price these series games? So subscription services seem to be attractive. When you sell something to a hospital and you make them take a subscription uh, and you price that at around a thousand euros a year, uh, there are so many costs going in and out of the hospital that nobody's ever going to notice this thousand euros a year. So if you can get away with that, that might be, might be a nice solution, then you still haven't solved all those other problems. Uh, how are you going to get the game to the users? Uh, how is it going to be reimbursed? So, what we feel might be a good option to explore is trying to develop a dedicated platform infrastructure with a, a license model on it. Trying to, we have to try to get into a dialogue with these institutions to, to develop a, a trusted environment that hospitals can use or rent from which they can take games, certain games. And these games can be about whatever. It doesn't even have to be games that the Gradle games have developed. It can be a platform that all series game developers might um, put their games on, something like Steam, but for health-related series games. What's important is that 
we again get the users, the end user, the hospitals and the, and the healthcare industry invested in setting this up. We cannot do that without them. We have no knowledge about these trusted environments. We have no knowledge about the communication protocols. Uh, we have no knowledge about what it takes to get uh, the, the healthcare industry to trust solutions like this. So there's the, we have to start a dialogue with them to create this platform. So price point, decided price based on the buyer's perspective uh, is something I'm going to show with an example underground. We saw a video about underground, a laparoscopic training game. Uh, when we first started this game, our vision was uh, we have two big target audiences. The first target or public audience, the primary target audience is uh, surgical professionals. People who have to practice their laparoscopic training skills. Uh, the second target audience was regular consumers. We work very hard to make this game playable with both uh, these tool shelves. But also, if you don't have the tool shelves with a regular Wii, like the TRC Wii U touchscreen uh, controller. So, the only difference between training and entertainment game in this product is using these shells. If you don't have the shells, you're not training, you're just playing an adventure puzzle game. The software doesn't change, uh, the levels don't change, the storyline doesn't change, nothing changes in software. The game is still the same game, uh, but you can just have a, a fun experience with it. Um, so, people view this game differently. We have talked with some marketing experts. Uh, we, our development studio does not have a big team of marketing experience. So we try to use external people for that. They look at this game and they say, well, from the medical side of things, I completely get this. This is going to be fantastic. From the entertainment perspective, well, uh, I don't know, maybe not so much. Uh, people might view this product as and also to shape first and as an entertainment game second that, that forces them, the consumers to think about the, what they think is the entertainment quality of the product. So consumers might view this game as a unique or a great title. However, surgeons might view this game as a triple A title. And based on this difference, you can also say something about the difference in price point. So where we think the payment players might only have 10 euros to spare to pay for this game, uh, surgeons might have 50 euros to spare to pay, uh, to pay for this game. So it's very tricky to establish a price point for a game like this that you are actually aiming at two different target audiences because we still want to use uh, one distribution platform. So this is going to be available on a digital distribution platform, uh, but I cannot put the game on twice, one with a 10 euro price tag and then one with a 50 euro price tag and say, if you're a surgeon, please click here, and if you're a gamer, please click here. So that's not going to work. Um, we are trying to get medical supplies companies on board in this project. So our, our idea is, we also, besides the software, we also have this hardware component. Um, we are now talking with companies that supply uh, medical instruments, for instance. There are a lot of them in Germany, uh, and we try to get them to be our primary reseller and distributor of this game. That means that they can go, they already have an existing network uh, with hospitals, uh, and with uh, surgeons, they can use their existing network and market this as a medical solution specifically to this target audience. So they are going to create the medical solution vibe around the game but they will not reach, the vibe will not reach the entertainment audience because of this very specific network. So, on the other hand, we're going to do a separate uh, marketing effort towards the entertainment gamers that has nothing to do with uh, medical connotation whatsoever. So that way we're going to try to separate, we're going to basically try to create two different images of one product. Uh, that allows us to have, for instance, different watchmans. Um, so I said, technically it's very easy to sell this to both markets. Uh, that's something that we're trying to, uh, trying to uh, utilize with all the, the products that we're doing. Uh, if we are going to build a series game that's supposed to be an entertainment game, well, we 
should challenge ourselves and try to make it fun enough for regular consumers to, to have a lot of fun playing it as well. So the third difference, acceptance. Serious games uh, are meant to be used as instruments, uh, but many of, them, many of them are not used as such yet. Uh, and that's basically, or that's uh, partially due to the lack of validated evidence that these serious games actually work, they actually do something, they result in an effect. So what does it take for a serious game to actually be used as an inter instrument or intervention? Um, well, for instance, in medicine or more surgery, it's very important that you do validation studies to on the effect of instruments and interventions that they use. And this proof for serious games is not always readily available. So again, with underground, uh, one of the first reactions that we got from these medical supplies companies that we're trying to sell the game to is, uh, please show me that it works. What kind of evidence do you have that this is actually a valid solution? Um, when we first started talking to them, we did have a lot. We've always toyed with the idea that we should try to do some research to say something about the validity of this game. But in all fairness, is the game developer, should that company be responsible for delivering that kind of evidence? Uh, the game developer should be responsible for developing the game. I think. But in the end, we did do, in cooperation with a, a hospital, we did do a number of studies. Uh, these studies are mainly related to the comparison between existing instruments and the instrument that we developed, the, the plastic tool shows. How do surgeons view and accept those instruments that we built in relation to the instruments that they normally use? Are, are they accepting of it? Um, so, a lot of good results are coming from that, but one important study still needs to be performed, uh, which is a randomized control trial in which we use a number of trainees that train with regular training simulators and a number of trainees that train with our game, and then at the end we compare the results of those two groups. Uh, and we try to make the correlation that training with our game is maybe just as effective as training with a simulator. If you are able to prove something like that, and, and you are able to publish it as a peer-reviewed study, then you have a very strong case. So, the discussion point, I'm not going to go into this very in depth. Uh, whose responsibility is it to organize, fund, and perform these studies? Uh, I think it's interesting to discuss. If you look at the serious game industry as a whole, uh, there are a lot of responsibilities that fall on the shoulders of developers at, at this time. Uh, they have to communicate with the, the, all the stakeholders, they have to design the game, they have to build the game, they have to publish the game, they have to do marketing. Uh, do they also have to do all the acceptance studies as well? So this is going to sound like you need a company that's much more than just a game development company. I think that's not really fair to ask of a developer. I think. Uh, if you have collaborations with research institutes, with medical supply companies, with rehabilitation institutes, they should pick up a big part of these uh, research-related uh, subjects. So fourth and last different difference between series games and entertainment games, projects versus products. Uh, many series game projects are initiated by researchers. Uh, they have a hypothesis that uh, Building a serious game that trains a specific uh, subject is going to make for a better training, for instance. Um, after research has completed, like initial research, to the effectiveness of the, the, the prototype of the version, uh, researchers are satisfied. They are able to uh, write an article, they are going to be able to publish it, and then they, uh, they have published it, which is their goal. And then, Research, the, the development team is then left with a prototype in which they have invested money, often, and time. Uh, but it's not done. You can't sell it. You have not a lot of investment from the researchers, like energy investment and ownership anymore because they already got what they wanted. So there's no product to be sold, there's no money to be made, but the game has to be finished, otherwise you, you have a, your investment is totally lost. So what can we do to try to counter this. Um, one example is make research institutions 
stakeholders in the monetization. Uh, I put this logo below, Cutting Edge. Uh, it's a subsidiary company that we uh, started together with two hospitals to build and market the underground surgical game. And we actually, we actually asked from these two hospitals to invest cash in this company in exchange for shares to build the game with. So these investors, these hospitals who are now actually investors, they have a, a cash debt to this product. So it is, it is in their best interest to see the whole project through. And if it turns out that the project will be more successful if, for instance, we have more uh, clinical evidence, then the hospitals will be the first party we go to to supply this clinical evidence. And they will say, well, we are invested in this product. We already have invested our money. Uh, we should try together to make this a success. So we'll, we will pick up this clinical evidence gathering uh, uh, task. Where do we stand as a company? Um, a lot of these problems, we've had these are first hand examples, things that we encounter during the development of our games. Uh, we are also looking at the future. We are uh, trying to initiate, initiate a couple of, uh, couple of ideas that might help us and a lot of other uh, serious game companies forward in the future. So one of them is uh, the development methodology. Talk about that a little bit. This goes back to the, the multiple stakeholder design problem. I think it would be very good to try to define a, a proven set of methods and methodologies that you can use to design a serious game together with stakeholders from different industries that also speak different languages than you do. So what if we would have some kind of textbook or workbook that we could use as a guideline with new partners to come to a design that everybody is invested in, but that also uh, has answers for questions from all these different stakeholders. Uh, then we are going towards what we call valid by design. If you use a methodology that has been proven to result in valid solutions, then if you use this methodology for new projects, you can also assume that these new products are also going to be valid as well. So closing, closing the gap between industries, um, there's the big gap between, for instance, health insurance companies, hospitals, developers, clients. We, uh, last year, we signed an investment deal with a hospital and an insurance company, health insurance company. They have taken a minority share in our company. Uh, and as such, are, we are now very close to the fire, the three of us, the three companies. Uh, for us as a developer, this is a very good thing. We are now, we have direct access to uh, healthcare professionals, intermediaries, uh, the people who think about reimbursing healthcare, uh, in, in healthcare projects from an insurance uh, standpoint. Uh, we have access to the clients. We hope this makes for a very flexible like, triangle, of, uh, triangle of, of corporations that is able to define new ways for series games to be built and to be deployed. So the third thing is the is a distribution platform. I talked about that. What if you can define a trusted distribution platform together with healthcare institutions that will be very valuable. That's something that we're actively looking at. Uh, because of this investment deal with the healthcare insurance company and with hospitals, we are very, very close ties with them. So we are able to discuss with them how exactly is your infrastructure organized, what can we do to utilize in the best way uh, the infrastructure that you already have, and can we use that to create this trusted platform that other people can use to distribute serious games to uh, medical institutions. In closing, if you are interested in learning more about this, I've linked a, a study that was commissioned by the European Union uh, into the state of serious games. This specifically goes for, this specific study is about social inclusion, so serious games for social inclusion, but it, it notes a lot of things that are applicable to uh, many different sort of serious games industry uh, branches. Um, I think this slide will be made available to you as well via the web. Uh, 
Shall we contest that? I don't know how we move for this, uh, for this talk. It's a very interesting talk. Um, that's it. If you want to learn, learn more, it's on Twitter. We have a website. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. for perhaps uh, expert people who have education in both uh, to handle uh, both uh, uh, the more direct uh, the direct side as well as the education or the, uh, the uh, communication between the, the two uh, the two things yeah so what's the value of someone who is yes. maybe a bit of both yeah, and both a designer and both a clinical expert. I think if you have someone on your team who is like that, you are in your luxury position. I talked with uh, Jean Baptiste uh, last night, the, the guy behind Dragon Box, and he is actually a mathematician with a very clear vision about what his Dragon Box product should be. Uh, and I told him, I think you're, you are a very lucky guy. You're in a very luxury position because you are able to be a translator between these different fields. And you're able to push the vision about this game, push it forward to all the, to all the people who are uh, invested in the project. So if you, if you are able to be like a, 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 an intermediary or a mediator or, or maybe what I, the term I coined was a little game designer or something, I think that's a really good position. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Lad Bond. I'm a first year student at Campus Scotland. My question to you is that the world is trying to get into the cyber psych psychology market to reduce medication in that field. Both universities in Canada and Ireland have invested in such labs. Do you think this will be the next step for serious games and have your company discussed this potential? Um, so do I think the next step for serious games is to Build research labs. That's what, no, that cyber right? psychology is the cyber psychology. Yeah, it's the tackled phobias. Okay, so serious games to tackle phobias, like the social anxiety game that, that's on the floor here? Uh, kinda, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if it's a cyber psychology game. <laughs> it's a, if it's a serious game. I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by the term cyber psychology. Uh, I think it can be fear of flying. Yeah. How to tell yeah. How or to fear of heights, or fear of people, or yeah. Yeah. So I think if it's um, what goes for that, that goes for a lot of other things. I think if you before we can say that games are an effective, uh, effective uh, tool to combat these anxieties, you have to do a lot of research. So I don't know a lot about the background between. Or the background behind combating anxieties like this, like what kind of psychology is used to combat uh, these anxieties, but you would have to look at are we able to translate this psychology, these psychology elements into game elements? Uh, and then once you have done that a number of times, I think you need to do a lot of testing. And you have to try to find proof that playing these games actually lessens the anxiety. So if I think before I would start up labs all over the country, I would want to have evidence that this route actually is a valid route. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello. Hello. Uh, you talked about proving that your game works as well as a simulator. Uh, but if it's a surgical uh, thing, isn't it hard to prove? Um, it is well hard to prove. I think it's not harder to prove than, for instance, the cyber psychology or social anxiety. Uh, I think there are a lot of scientific methods that you can use to prove the effectiveness of instruments. Um, that's not very different from surgery than it is from 
شما شما رو فیلی شد Yes, I got the feeling that if uh, they play a game, people will think they play a game. Yeah. So, would they want allow someone to test it out, or how do they test it out? Well, they use. I think it's very important that uh, I, I want them to feel like they're just playing a game. Uh, the, what was briefly mentioned in the, in the film that I showed is there are a lot of simulators that are used nowadays to train churches uh, to keep their skills up the bar. And these simulators are often really boring. They resemble very accurately a, a real uh, surgical procedure, but that's something that surgeons are doing like every day, all day. So when they come off the clock at five, they are kind of fed up with uh, doing yet another surgery. So if we can provide them with a game, uh, then hopefully that might give them more enthusiasm to work on their skills. And what we have to prove is the correlation between when you play our game and when you use a simulator for training. So what we want to do with this randomized control trial is if you have some people using a simulator and some people using our game for the same amount of time and then we compare the increase in their skills and we see that there is indeed an increase in skills or maybe it's better or maybe it's worse, maybe it's the same. Then you can say something about the effectiveness of using a game like this for training. But it's, it's, it's a good question, I think. We as a developer will, will never claim that this is a good product and you should use it if you want to be a better surgeon. Uh, we want to leave that to third parties who do their own uh, independent research. So that's, that's I think, what is the best, the best way to show the effectiveness of the game. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm Jan Kuhn. Uh, I'm what do you believe about uh, virtual reality and HMDs as open Shift or Project Morpheus? Yeah, so virtual reality in relation to serious games. Yeah. Uh, I, I can imagine, I don't, have, I don't know for sure, but I can imagine for instance in social anxiety problems that something like Oculus Rift can be very beneficial. Uh, if you want to position somewhere, someone in a situation, for instance, uh, fear of heights, uh, use the Oculus Rift to put them. Uh, in progressively higher environments, uh, I think that it's, it's certainly possible that that height is the level of realism, and if it height is the level of realism, maybe it also heightens the, uh, the potential to uh, less than the anxiety as well. So yeah, I, I think definitely interesting to experiment with that. Okay. No more questions? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>